On October 16, 1869, two men digging a well for a farmer in Cardiff, New York, would make a shocking discovery when their shovels hit something hard in the dirt. They would uncover what appeared to be a giant, petrified man lying naked in the ground. News of the discovery would enthrall the nation, bringing visitors from all around to see the spectacle. But experts would soon uncover the truth of the giant. I'm Amanda Morgan, and this is New York's Dark Side. Hey everyone, the story I have for you today is a bit different from what I had originally planned because I just needed more time to work on that one and because I needed something a bit lighthearted to release this week. I've deviated course a bit and today I'm bringing you the story of what has been called the greatest hoax in the United States history. And to my utter surprise, the man who started it all lived in my area. This is the story of the Cardiff Giant. On April 26, 1821, George Hull was born in Sydney's Ford, Connecticut, to parents he would later describe as Puritans. I really don't know what his young life was like, but he began reading religious philosophy at a young age and eventually decided to become an atheist. He lived in Sydney's Ford until he was 28, and he became well known for his heated arguments about religion wherever he went with anyone who would take his bait. George was described in a few sources as looking like a villain, with his black hair, black beard and mustache, and wearing black from head to toe. I'm thinking of him as an 1800s goth. He stood an imposing 6'3", which was tall for the time. George would get into some trouble in his adult life, earning himself some jail time for petty crimes, such as developing a new form of marked playing cards. In 1853, George moved to Broome County, New York, where he would settle in the town of Shenango and lived with his family, John and Sarah Hull, and their seven children. I'm hoping this was a pretty big house. I might have to dive into some public records because I'm curious now. The family owned a thriving cigar company called Hull, called Hull and Grimond Diamond Cigars, which had a factory on the corner of Henry and Water Street in Binghamton. This is where the Lost Dog Cafe is now for all my Binghamton peoples. I do recommend it if you're ever in the area. George was described as being imaginative and innovative, even though he was not well educated. He would develop a modified horse strap sometime in the 1860s that would be widely used at the time. George would marry his niece, Helen, which was an especially big scandal because not only was she 16 at the time of their marriage, she was also already pregnant. In 1866, George would go to Ackley, Iowa, He had given the husband of his wife's sister, so in other words, his other niece's husband, nephew-in-law, whatever. Anyway, he'd given him 10,000 cigars to sell, and he was checking in on their progress. Things were not going well there, however, and there was no money from the sale of the cigars, and their farm was encumbered, so he stayed and helped them clear their mortgage. While in Ackley, he met Reverend Harry Turk a traveling revivalist Methodist minister who was also staying with his niece and her husband. This was perfect for George because he liked to get into very heated debates about religion, and he did not waste this opportunity. They got into a debate about the fourth verse in the sixth chapter of Genesis, where Turk took the side of the literal interpretation of, quote, there were giants in the earth in those days, unquote, and George took the very opposite approach. While he couldn't get Reverend Turk to change his mind, this gave George an idea. George, George decided he was going to out all the religious believers as fools while proving his point and making himself a very hefty prophet in doing so. He sat and formulated the idea for about two years before he sold his home and business in Binghamton and moved to Iowa in June of 1868. He avoided the family he had in Ackley. He and a partner, H.B. Martin, traveled to Fort Dodge, Iowa, where there were several gypsum mines. They purchased a five-ton block measuring about 12 foot by 4 foot by 22 inches. The block of gypsum was then shipped to Chicago to a marble cutter named Edward Burkhart, who hired two sculptors named Henry Saul and Fred Mormon to do the work. 
George Hull was heavily involved in the carving of the giant man, purchasing quilts and carpets to help deaden the sound of chisels, and keeping the sculptors happy with a steady supply of beer. The statue took the form of a naked man lying on his back, with his right arm grasping at his stomach and one leg crossed over the other, and its face frozen with a mysterious half-smile, very Mona Lisa-like. After they were done sculpting the giant, George did his best to try to age the look of it to make it more realistic. He used a combination of chemicals on the stone, including sulfuric acid. He also took a block of wood, put darning needles in it, and repeatedly hit the statue to try to give the skin the appearance of pores. When he dove, he dove deep. Once they were done, they packed up the statue, weighing about 3,000 pounds, in a box marked Finished Marble, and transported it by train from Chicago to the town of Union in New York. It would remain at the station for about a month before George had it moved by wagon to his cousin William Stubb Newell's farm in the town of Cardiff. They hid the statue for a period of time under some straw and hay until November when George and William buried the 10-foot statue in a marshy area behind William's barn. The whole affair cost George Hull about $2,600, which would equate to about $50,000 today. George went back to Binghamton, and they waited for almost a year before enacting the next part of their plan. In October of 1869, William Newell hired two men to come dig a well for him. On October 16th, their shovels hit something hard. It was the foot of the giant, and they would slowly unearth all ten feet of him. News of their discovery spread quickly. That evening, there were people arriving on the farm to see the giant. The following day, news of the discovery had spread to nearby Syracuse, and even more visitors came. It made the newspapers, drawing people from far away. William Newell quickly erected a tent around the giant and began to charge admission, charging 50 cents for 15 minutes to view it. As many as 300 to 500 people were coming per day to see the giant, and one Sunday, as many as 2,600 people arrived. Newell continued to try to grow his profit by selling refreshments, and he had vendors come on site. The town of Cardiff benefited from all the increased visitation. One thing to understand about the times and the success of the Cardiff Giant was the country's take on religion at the time. This was a period after the Second Great Awakening that occurred in the 1820s and 30s, where the United States saw a rebirth of religious sentiment for many of the citizens. This was especially true in the area of New York where Cardiff is located, in the Burned Over District. The term Burned Over District came from the belief that the revivalist movement left no one else to be Christianized, just like fire burns everything in its path. Another aspect to consider is the growing interest in science, sparking the interest of the people. Charles Darwin had just released The Origin of Species the previous decade. Even though people were interested in science, Many of them didn't have a lot of knowledge in the subject and would spread false information. There were two main groups who spread beliefs regarding the Cardiff giant. One group believed that the giant was truly a fossilized man, even though science states that soft parts of an animal were never petrified. The other group believed that the giant was a statue that had been buried for hundreds of years. John Boynton, a local lecturer, believed that the giant statue was created to impress local Native Americans by the Jesuit missionaries in the 1600s. Even the director of the New York State Museum, a national expert and distinguished paleontologist, examined the giant and was quoted in a November 3, 1869 article of the Worcester Daily Spy as stating the giant was, quote, the most remarkable object yet brought to light in this country, and although perhaps not dating from the Stone Age, is nevertheless deserving the attention of archaeologists, unquote. He fell into the group of people that did not believe the giant was a petrified man, but a statue that was related to the people who formerly lived in the upstate New York area. George Hull's cousin, William Newell, would sell interest in the giant to some prominent businessmen in New York. Dr. Amos Westcott, a dentist in Syracuse, David Hannum, a wealthy landowner in Cortland County, and another man all invested in the Cardiff Giant for a total of $37,500, or about $850,000 in 2024. George Hull received a piece of this sale and used the money to purchase a new home and commercial block in Binghamton. One thing he did not do was pay the two men who had sculpted the giant for him, and this would come back to bite him in the ass later. 
The new owners of the statue would move the Cardiff Giant from Newell's Farm to Syracuse to put it on display, and the city came out to celebrate. Public officials, businessmen, and the press were all out to witness. There was a marching band that played See the Conquering Hero Comes When the Giant Entered the City. More than 1,000 visitors would pay to see the Cardiff Giant on its first day in the new exhibit. About 60,000 would see the giant during the first six weeks. The giant was such a popular attraction that the New York City Railroad even arranged for trains to stop in Syracuse so that passengers could get off for a period of time to go see the giant before resuming their original trek. Even though many people bought into the hoax, there were some that realized it was a hoax from the beginning, including scientists, members of the press, and the author Mark Twain. Mark Twain would try to warn readers of the Buffalo Express newspaper about believing in the myth of the giant. A mining engineer named Fillmore Smith would also reach out to the press to tell them that gypsum was soluble in water and that should the giant truly have been buried for as long as it had been believed to be, it would not be as in pristine condition as it was. As news spread about the giant, the people of Fort Dodge, Iowa would remember seeing George Hull buying his giant block of gypsum. There were also farmers around Cardiff and Tully who would come forward as witnesses who saw George Hull and William Newell with a wagon and a crate bringing the giant to the farm. Another paleontologist from Yale University, O.C. Marsh, would examine the statue and said that the giant was, quote, of very recent origin and a decided humbug, unquote. George Hull himself had a role in the truth of the hoax being discovered because he had a big mouth and he started bragging about the scheme. He even started planning to write a book about the Cardiff giant to make more money. Rumors about the the giant being a hoax only continued to fuel interest in the giant with more people coming to see it. They even started to refer to the giant as Old Hoaxy. There was so much interest in it that P.T. Barnum offered to purchase the giant for a three-week lease, offering the owners $60,000. They turned him down, instead planning to move the giant to New York City. Barnum, however, would not be deterred. He had an exact copy of the statue created in Syracuse and moved it to New York City, His copy made it to New York City first, where he heavily promoted it. The original was moved to the Apollo Hall at 28th and Broadway on December 20th, but more people at this point were visiting the replica than the original. The owners tried to take Barnum to court to have Barnum's exhibit canceled, but the case was turned down by the court. The sculptor who created Barnum's copy would actually make more copies, and they were also displayed around other areas of the country. The duel between Barnum's replica and the original only fueled more attention from the newspapers. Barnum's replica would win the day, however, due to his marketing skills. The replica continued to draw crowds while hardly any would come to see the original. David Hannum, one of the owners of the Cardiff Giant, would coin the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute, in response to the crowds lining up to see the replica. An article on Press Connects by Gerald Smith and George Basler would point out the irony that the phrase coined by Hannum is attributed to be coined by P.T. Barnum. George Hall would later say that he believed not involving P.T. Barnum in his scheme was one of his biggest blunders. The owners of the giant would move it from New York City to Boston, hoping to draw bigger crowds, and this worked initially. However, in February of 1870, the two sculptors that George Hull failed to pay in full for their work would confess to a newspaper. They wrote a letter to the Chicago Tribune discussing their work and offered to provide affidavits to prove their claims. This decreased visitation of the giant more, and the owners eventually turned the giant over to a photographer named Kelvin Gott, who took the giant on tour across the Northeast, but people were no longer interested in seeing it. By the fall of 1871, the statue was stored in an icebox in Gott's yard. Unfortunately for the initial three investors, they lost money and their reputations. The Syracuse dentist, Dr. Walcott, who had invested in the giant, had deeply believed in the validity of the giant and was so destroyed by the truth that in July of 1873, he would take his own life. George Hull, however, was completely fine with the truth coming out. He even tried to replicate the hoax, working with P.T. Barnum this time to create another giant statue in his ice house where he had moved his family in Elkland, Pennsylvania. He wanted to pass this statue off as a fossilized missing link and created the statue to be humanoid. It was about seven and a half feet tall and weighed over 600 pounds. The statue had a tail coming from the back. Barnum and Hull had the statue moved to Pueblo, Colorado, about 25 miles west of Pueblo, Colorado, and buried. It was discovered on September 16, 1877. 
this statue would get the name of Solid Muldoon. The Muldoon would tour across areas such as Colorado Springs and Denver as it made its way eastward to New York City. The whole scheme was a flop, however, because people didn't fall for it a second time. George Hull had invested more than $10,000 in the Muldoon, and he didn't get much return on this investment. Hull would move back to Binghamton to attempt to reestablish his cigar business, and that failed. He moved from the Binghamton area in the 1880s, moving to California and then Wisconsin before returning to Binghamton in the 1890s, where he lived with a daughter on Robert Street. He would pass away on October 21st, 1902, after an illness. The original Cardiff Giant moved through several hands over the years. It was even a coffee table in Gardner Cowles, an Iowa publisher's rumpus room for a time. In 1949, the Cardiff Giant returned home to New York through the work of Stephen C. Clark. Clark brought the New York State Historical Association to Cooperstown. The Giant now resides in the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown, New York. The Giant has been mentioned in some literature, including stories by Mark Twain, L. Frank Baum, and is mentioned in a Nancy Drew mystery. And that, my friends, was the tale of Old Hoaxy, the Cardiff Giant. I just found the whole story fascinating. I, I love coming across these little pieces of history that I had no idea about. And the fact that it was kind of crafted, at least the idea of it was crafted in basically in my backyard in Binghamton, New York, just made it all the more fascinating to me to look into. I'm definitely planning to go up to see the Cardiff Giant here when the Farmer's Museum opens back up in April. I'm excited to kind of go check it out. Um, all the sources for this episode will be on our website. I've got some photos there as well that I'll also share on social media. I found one of George Hull. Um, I don't, I don't know if he looks kind of villainous. He, he looks very 1850s with his hair and mustache and beard. Um, made me giggle a little bit, but please take a moment to make sure you are following the show on your podcast platform of choice. I'd also love it if you would just take a moment and give us a review or share the show to help other like-minded people enjoy our fun little bits of history. And I mean, I would count this as true crime. He hoaxed the nation, made a book, <laughs> and tried to do it again and thought he was the greatest thing ever. Don't forget, you can also follow us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can check out our Patreon. This week, I did not release an early episode. It's just been a bit too crazy at home right now. I've got things going on. My family's kind of facing a an impending loss of a family member, so it's just, I just couldn't do it, hence my deviating course, so... I am undecided if I am going to release an episode next week just with all of that going on. So please be aware there may not be an episode next week, but I will be back with more true crime, dark history, and some cryptids. I have cryptids coming up too. So uh, with that, I hope everyone has a great week ahead and I hope you stay curious.